<laughs> All right, let's see here. The tablet, as we uh, remember from yesterday, was bugging me about a software update. Well, look, it's it's uh, still doing that, so uh, we'll maybe need a second to get started here, but that's all right. Um, so, uh, does anybody have any questions or anything from yesterday? Um, we kind of started by discussing matter. Uh, we did some kind of, you know, discussion of how we can classify matter. We had uh, pure substances versus mixtures, and we could see that we could break either of those uh, into other classifications as well. Right, we, uh, we were able to break our pure substances into elements and compounds. Remember, elements just have one type of atom, uh, an atom uh, being the kind of smallest little piece we can uh, kind of separate, really. And then uh, the compounds on the other side had multiple different types of atoms. So like water, for example, would be a compound because it has hydrogen atoms as well as oxygen atoms. Uh, and we, we looked at that. Uh, we then looked at mixtures. We saw some could be uh, homogeneous, meaning they're the same throughout. Um, and then we had heterogeneous mixtures, which would be ones that are different throughout. Um, and kind of we could think about a homogeneous mixture being something like honey, where you have your various sugars uh, dissolved in your water, and it's kind of the same throughout uh, the entire uh, kind of mixture there. Uh, whereas something like um, a salad would be uh, a heterogeneous mixture because you have different parts. Okay, tablet is finally restarting, so hopefully that means good news. We'll see what we get from there. So we'll start our connection software up. But yeah, if anybody has any uh, questions or whatever, throw them out. We'll, we'll get to them. Otherwise, we'll continue talking about matter, and then we'll uh, talk about energy for a bit as well. Alrighty, let's enter the pin. Okay, I think we're good to go. Once the tablet finally finishes, like, kind of loading. Do -do 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 -do. Lucky us, by the way, it's our Friday. Ha ha, oh, amazing already. Isn't that nice? Um, so we'll probably finish up chapter one today and, uh, we'll start chapter two next week. Um, some of you have asked about like the homework and stuff already, um, but that's going to be stuff from chapter two. So, uh, there is no rush to necessarily get started on that. Um, in the meantime, though, while this tablet is deciding its life story, um, let me, uh, let's go to canvas real quick. Uh, and I want to show you something. Let's see. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. For the lab part of the class, um, one thing that I necessarily didn't talk to you about already uh, is that we're going to be doing uh, simulations. Good morning, Dominique. Um, using Labster. So Labster is a platform that uh, the state of California has purchased for you guys. Uh, so we can... Uh, do some fake labs so uh with this uh there's a little like short little youtube video that's going to show you kind of what you'll be doing in the uh, lab simulations and i'll be uh, assigning them every so often throughout the semester so uh, you're gonna have two that are due january 31st that's in 11 days so just under two weeks um so those will just be on safety information um, there may be some overlap between them, but it, it's uh, kind of like our, our what we would be doing in the first week of lab anyway, right? It's that kind of like safety stuff. And I'll be assigning these um, kind of throughout the semester, um, depending uh, on the topics that we're doing. So um, yeah, that'll be there. So they'll be on Canvas. Uh, for you guys, I know this looks crazy because I have a lot of stuff going on, uh, but you're only able to see the stuff that's green. So uh, you'll be able to see these pretty close to the top of the page there. Uh, and so you can go ahead and do those. Uh, there shouldn't really be uh, an order to doing them. You can do them in whatever order you want. Um, 
they're kind of talking about similar things. One's about the chemicals itself, and the other's kind of just the lab in general. So, cool. Um, as you can see, we have maybe, what, like 10 or so? I don't know how to count. Uh, 10 or so over the semester uh, that we'll have. And so, um, yeah. Any questions on the uh, lab simulation stuff? You can't hear anything. Uh, is that a problem that anyone else has? Anybody else having auditory issues? Type it out. And in the meantime, we'll try and figure out what's happening with the uh, tablet here, who's decided to optimize all the, all the apps now. Go figure. So, note to self, like, 20 minutes is not enough to update your tablets before class. <laughs> so, oh well. No auditory issues. Okay, um, not sure what to say there then. Um, that's all I can kind of suggest. Uh, yeah, something or unmuting. Yeah, that's kind of all we can do. All right, now it is optimizing the storage. Maybe we'll get to some chemistry today. Wait, 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 I think we're good. Maybe. Yes, yes, I actually see, like, the background. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. Do, 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 do. Let's get this guy connected. And we'll start some chemistry. Okay, there we go. Ha ha, hooray. No, no worries. Okay. Alrighty, we are finally in business for today. So, uh, we're going to talk about properties of matter now. And uh, properties are kind of kind of be just characteristics. So uh, some things we can identify about a piece of matter that might distinguish it from another one. Uh, and we can kind of broadly group these into two categories. We have physical, oh my goodness. We've got physical properties and we have chemical properties. Um, and we're going to know that these uh, physical ones are going to be the ones that we're probably more familiar with, uh, the ones that are kind of easy for us to determine, relatively speaking. Um, something that is a physical property would be something that we can uh, kind of identify with our eyes or instruments. So some sort of uh, scientific instrument could be used uh, to identify a physical property. So uh, if we look at a few of them, I'll just put a couple out and we'll see if we can come up with some more. So uh, for example, size is a physical property. Uh, we can see how big something is. Uh, color is another one. Uh, you know, I'm writing in blue now. Uh, that is the property of that word that I have written there. Uh, shape is another one, like this thing uh, is cylindrical-ish. Uh, these are things we can kind of identify easily about a piece of matter. Uh, let's go ahead and throw some out there. Let's see if you can uh, come up with some physical properties as well. Um, one that we might need an instrument for would be like conductivity. Does it conduct electricity or heat? Uh, you know, that's not something we're able to do with our eyes necessarily, uh, but we can use instruments to determine that. And we'll see, you know, like metals and that sort of thing will be very good conductors, but something, uh, yeah, smell, sure. Why not? Uh, conductivity, you know, for certain other things will be like rubber, for example, would be very uh, low. So, um but again, not something we could identify with our eyes, but we would need an instrument for that. Uh, what else do we have? And of course, by eyes, I do mean like all your instruments, right? Or all your senses, so 
Um, how about something like texture? Is it rough? Is it smooth? You know, is it lumpy? Uh, you know, those things we can also identify, right? Um, maybe location where something is that's a property about it right now i have uh i don't know i've got my uh microphone here it is to the left of me ta-da uh that's its location exciting um we have so many other ones we can talk about we can talk about um you know kind of uh strength so does it break easily? Toughness, uh, that sort of thing. There's a lot of uh, you know properties we can talk about here. Well, that's enough, though. I mean, you'll see that there's uh, a lot of physical properties, but chemical ones, there's not too many. Um, yeah, density is a physical property as well. Yeah. So density is kind of, uh, it's the ratio of mass to volume. So it's how kind of heavy something is for its size. So like a brick would be more dense than, uh, you know, water or something. So, yeah, cool. Um, if we go to chemical properties, so these are going to be kind of less obvious to us um, and ones that we can't really, um, can't really use an instrument to identify. And uh, with chemical properties, it's always the ability to do something. It's not the um, act itself. Uh, the first and most common example of a chemical property would be something like flammability. I think there's two M's in flammability. So that is, uh, that flammability talks about if something is going to burn or not. So if I take a piece of paper and light it on fire, is it going to burn? Uh, yes, it is. That is a chemical property of the paper. So the ability of that to burn. But if I try lighting a block of or a brick on fire, um, probably not really going to catch on fire, right? It's, uh, it doesn't really have uh, the property of flammability. Another one would be uh, corrosion. Or that would be kind of like the tendency to corrode. Like, for example, iron tends to rust. So uh, if you leave your tools out uh, and there's some like rain or just like the condensation in the morning, uh, just having that water there can cause your iron to rust uh, and uh, bad things happen, right? So uh, the tendency of something to corrode would be another chemical property. And this is kind of really the only two that we're going to talk about um, that are kind of specific. We just have generally, you know, the ability to react. With something. So uh, flammability is reacting with oxygen. Uh, and corrosion is uh, a different type of oxidation process. Uh, but broadly speaking, a chemical property is something's ability to react with something else. So um, that's uh, kind of how we have that there. Again, none of these are kind of easy for us to determine. Uh, these are either done experimentally or um, theoretically and then carried out later. But uh, for us, um, kind of just these three are going to be the big ones for us. Alrighty, cool. Uh, there's plenty of other physical properties as well uh, that I didn't necessarily put here, but there's so many of them. We've got like viscosity. That's how like thick a liquid is, uh, how easily it flows. You've got electrical resistance. You know, you've got so many more. I I'm not going to just keep putting them because uh, they're, there are just too many. Alrighty, cool. So, what we can do with these properties so when we mess with these uh, 
um, we get a physical change. Oh, one big one that I hadn't put on our list uh, is State of Matter. So knowing that something is solid uh, is a physical property about it. So when we mess with these properties, we're going to get what's called a physical change. For example, go to a different blue. When we go from ice to water to steam, if we feel like doing that, uh, these are physical changes. So we are taking a property of our substance and we're changing it. So uh, we still have, we have H2O is the substance for all of these. Um, and all we're doing is kind of changing its state of matter. So if our water is in the ice form and we melt it, uh, we are just changing its state of matter. We're changing one of its physical properties. Um, and so that's called a physical change. Uh, what kind of defines a physical change? Is that we are not changing the substance. Uh, so we note that this is going to be H2O no matter what state of matter it's in. Uh, you know, that would just be a thing about the temperature, right? Um, and so we're not changing this substance. And because we aren't changing it, these are generally reversible. So if we have water, can we turn it back into ice? Yeah, right? We just throw it in the freezer and now it's ice again. Or if we have uh, water, can we turn it into steam again? Yeah, we can do that. We can boil it. Uh, so because we don't change uh, our actual substance itself, uh, it's just a physical change, and it's generally reversible. Um, so if we take another physical property, for example, the location of my microphone, here it is, I'm going to move it this direction. Aha. Uh -huh. Have I changed the microphone? Is it still a microphone? Yeah, I haven't changed its composition at all. It's still the same substance as it was before. Um, and look, I can put it all the way back again. Ta-da! I have reversed that process uh, without harm. Uh, but most important, though, is that I have not changed the substance. So when I moved something from one place to another, it's still the same thing. It's a physical change. Um, what else do we have? What's another example? Um, I can take a mask here that I have. I can fold it and crumple it. I have changed its shape. Is it still a mask? Yeah. Right, it hasn't changed its uh, composition at all. Uh, and now look, I can put it back to the way it was. So uh, that's kind of physical changes there. So something that does not change our substance. Uh, while these are generally reversible, sometimes it's really hard to reverse them. Uh, for example, if I cut a piece of paper in half, um, I can't really put that back together again. I'm just kind of changing its size and shape but it's still paper. So uh, it's that's still going to be a physical change. All right, on the other hand, a chemical change will alter the substance. So for example, if I take some wood and burn it, with oxygen, I will get carbon dioxide and water out uh, if I do that. Um, and so I am changing what the wood was, uh, a bunch of various hydrocarbons um, or carbohydrates, 
uh, and I'm changing it into carbon dioxide and water. Those are different substances uh, than they were before. Um, and so if we think, can I take carbon dioxide and water and turn them into wood and oxygen? I mean, plants could over many years, but not really. Like, it can't really get exactly the same uh, piece of wood out again, right? Um, so these are generally not reversible. Because they fundamentally will change uh, your substance. So, um, as a result, because they're changing your substance, uh, it's hard to go backwards. So, um, I mean, there's things we can do, like, yeah, plants will take carbon dioxide and water and put them together, but they're not going to make exactly the same wood as before. Whereas, with, our, with the mask that I folded, I was able to get it back into the same shape it was. Uh, or, you know, moving the microphone, I was able to get it exactly where it used to be. So that is as if no change ever happened. But once you do a chemical change, there's no going back without um, putting in a ton of energy uh, or at all. Another example, we talked about rusting. Uh, so iron is Fe. This would be rust here. That's iron. Uh, once your tool has rusted, all you can do is clean it off nothing you can do that iron that turned to uh iron two iron three oxide will uh be completely rusted forever uh unless you apply a ton of electricity to it um so not gonna happen on its own not gonna go backwards so uh unfortunately not reversible so those would be chemical changes um just for uh some while we're here um, this is generally uh, described as a chemical reaction. We're not going to study reactions uh, until uh, kind of the end of the semester, um, but this is kind of what they look like. So we have something turning into something else. Chemical reactions typically talk about chemical changes. We have reactants. Uh, on the left side of the arrow, and we have products on uh, the right side of the arrow. So uh, a chemical reaction will always involve these two. So you'll always have a reactant or multiple reactants and one product or more than one product. Um, and so uh, just making sure that we, we have some terminology there as well. So, um, cool. Any questions on that sort of stuff? The, the changes we've talked about or the properties? Or if there's anything that you'd like, hey, is this a physical property? Happy to go over that as well. Alrighty. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Dissolving Kool Aid in water. Okay. Uh huh. I see where you're going with this. So, um, all right. Speaking of which, I didn't even bring my coffee. It's still in the kitchen. Oh, no. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that would be a, a physical change you're doing. You're taking kind of uh, two things, mixing them together. Um, and uh, you're going to be able to separate them out again. Yeah, so this is uh, because you're not changing the substance. You're just dissolving it in water. Uh, it's just going to be physical. So... Um, we're going to see in just a little bit, I'm going to just finish up with this kind of section here. We're going to talk about how to separate bits of matter. Um, and so one that would be very good for separating your Kool-Aid mix from the water would be distillation. 
Um, so there is one. There are uh, ways that we know of that we can uh, kind of uh, separate mixtures uh, pretty easily. And so uh, we're going to see that mixing of things would be uh, physical for sure. And so yeah, let's go ahead and put that up there. So let's put dissolving or mixing. So that depends if those two are mixing, Cassie. Um, if they are chemically bonding together, that's going to be a chemical change. Um, but if you're just taking like pigments and putting them together, uh, you actually don't have a new pigment in there. It's just your eyes will interpret seeing both pigments at once as green. So uh, it just depends there. I, I, I don't necessarily know a lot about um, paints or dyes. I'm assuming they're not going to be reacting together, so it's probably something physical uh, that you'd be able to separate using chromatography, um, which is, in fact, I guess the word actually even means color separating. So, uh, But uh, I, I'm more inclined to say that's a physical um, mixing of... Uh, different compounds you're putting together to give an effect on your eyes. Um, but there are other ways to like make colorful things using chemistry uh, for chemical uh, reactions. That's going to be stuff that's covered in 113 uh, with transition metal chemistry. And that's bleh. It's awful. But anyways, uh, one more thing to note on this before we move on to separation now that we're kind of talking about that. So fireworks would definitely be a chemical change, right? Where we're turning um, uh, we're kind of exciting atoms with that. We talk about this in chapter four. Uh, when we excite certain atoms by giving them heat or other energy types, we can get them to uh, kind of give off light of, of a different color. But those sometimes, um, the, the kind of like explosion of the firework is a chemical change, but the like actual emission of the light in that uh, process is just physical. So uh, when you excite, um, let's say, copper atoms, they give this lovely green color, uh, but there's still copper atoms at the end of the day. However, the uh, energy that you're giving those copper atoms to kind of give off that green color, that's coming from a chemical reaction. That's whatever your, your gunpowder or whatever it is, is uh, exploding uh, with oxygen. So that one, uh, the fireworks actually have multiple components. Uh, some are physical, some are chemical. Okay, let me write this down before I forget. Matter cannot be created or destroyed. Uh, we can never create or destroy matter. We can only transform it into different things. Uh, for example, we have taken our reactants and we've turned them into a new product, but we have not destroyed anything or created anything uh, with this. And so we have a law of conservation of mass, which tells you that in a chemical reaction, your mass of your pro uh, products, whatever, I guess I can do products first, will always equal your mass of your reactants. Um, so we can't create new matter or destroy it. So whenever we undergo a reaction, we're going to have the same mass uh, on either side. Mass is, um, remember, it's an amount of substance. So uh, whether that's counting the atoms, typically we, we describe mass uh, as weight, whereas weight is actually a force, but whatever, it's, it's mass. Uh, I'm not a physicist. I don't care about that distinction. All the stuff we do in chemistry anyway, at least in... Uh, all of these classes is done on Earth anyway, so mass and weight are going to be the same for us. Anyways, um, yeah, so you, you can't uh, can't mess with matter that way. Uh, the same thing with energy. So you, uh, where you have conservation of energy as well, you can't create or destroy energy. Again, you can just kind of like transform it into different forms. All right, cool.
So, uh, let's talk about separating mixtures now, since that's kind of where we wanted to go. Though, I'm going to grab my coffee real quick. Oh, bad news, it's kind of cold. But we'll drink it anyway. Temperature would be another physical property, by the way. All right, separating mixtures. So uh, let's let's take a couple of uh, our. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples and see. Let's see if we can't just figure out how we would uh, separate these. Mixture one. I have a bag of green and blue marbles, and I want to separate them. I have, well, let's just do one at a time. So if you had a bag of green and blue marbles and you wanted to separate them, how would you do it? Look, while I draw, you guys can answer the question. How would you get these to be separated? How would you separate these? Not a trick question. Yeah, just manually do it, right? Just pull them out of the bag and separate them. Yeah, easy. So uh, physically, you could just move them apart. So with big things, yeah, you would just use your hands, take it out. Okay, this is blue, it goes in the blue pile. This one's green, it goes in the green pile. Done. Easy. Uh, so when we have nice and big things like marbles, uh, we can just use manual separation, not a problem. Uh, however, sometimes we have things that are not so easy to separate just by hand. For example, if we had a mixture of sand and water. How might we separate the sand from the water here? What do we think is going to, um, how are we going to do this? Sand and water. I just like having fun with the, the colors. Yeah, exactly. So uh, we have a device uh, where we can put something like a filter on it, like a coffee filter, uh, and we can pour in our sand mixture in this goes, and we're going to get all of our sand kind of up here, and we would get our water uh, out at the bottom, right? Uh, this process is called filtration. Uh, and you can use filtration. Uh, that's a filter, by the way, that green thing there. By the way, if any of you can't see any of these colors that I'm doing, whether it's like color blindness or just like they're really hard to see, let me know and I'll try and avoid using those. Um, but I, I like to use fun colors. Because, yeah, why not? Uh, and you would use filtration to uh, separate. Uh, um, insoluble. That means it's not dissolved. Uh, particles from a liquid. So um, just like with making coffee, uh, you would separate your coffee grains or, or granules uh, from the, the coffee liquid 
uh, through a filter, right? So you uh, you put your water uh, through the filter and the, co the coffee comes out but leaves all the grounds behind. Uh, so same thing here, if we had our, our sand that we wanted to separate, we would just filter it. Uh, and, and then we would be able to separate it that way. So, so far these have both been heterogeneous mixtures, right? We've had this bag of marbles and then we had this uh, water and sand mixture. Those are both heterogeneous. When we have homogeneous mixtures, though, uh, those get a little bit tougher. We have to use a bit more kind of ingenuity here. What about salt water? How are we going to uh, separate salt from water? Uh, this is kind of what we discussed with the Kool-Aid. Uh, so we have our salt water here. Unfortunately, it's a homogeneous mixture, so we can't really see the salt, but it's in there. Um, we have uh, a way to approach this. If we wanted to do it, yeah, we would have to distill it. So depending if we cared about getting the water, we could just boil the water away and off it goes as steam and we would get our salt out at the bottom. But if we were interested in collecting the water, we would have to distill it. Uh, this is also the process used so uh, when uh, alcohol is made, uh, specifically uh, spirits like whiskey or vodka or gin, um, originally you, you kind of have beer and you distill it to kind of concentrate the alcohol in it. Uh, and the process is just the same as it, as it is for uh, getting the salt water to separate. So you have a mixture of ethanol in water and you're trying to separate some of that water out so you get uh, kind of more concentrated ethanol. So definitely a, a big uh, thing that's used in the industry all the time, uh, food industry. But technically you would have some sort of uh, device really kind of hastily drawn there. Not so good at drawing that sort of thing. But you would have your salt water in here. You would heat it up. Have some red in there too. Whoosh. We're heating up our uh, solution and it's going to form steam that will then condense here and we're, we're able to collect then the, the pure water out uh, as, it, as it goes up as steam and we're able to collect our water. And what we would be left with would be the uh, salt uh, that was dissolved previously. So um, this is called distillation. So we could either just boil it away or we could distill it. Uh, and that's how we would separate that. Alrighty. What if... The last one though is kind of the toughest one. Let's say we had Cassie's pigments. We had her, her uh, yellow and blue pigments there, or rather it's a green pigment, and we wanted to separate out the uh, yellow and blue pigments uh, from that. That's a tougher thing to do. Uh, when substances have similar boiling points, We can't really use distillation anymore because uh, if we distill it and they boil at the same temperature, then they're just going to come out together anyway. Uh, we have a, the last technique, which is the most labor intensive. We use chromatography. And this is um, in the chemistry industry is probably the biggest um, kind of application there is uh, to understanding chemistry is chromatography. So a very, very important thing, especially in the drug industry, is how do you purify or kind of isolate your particular drug while getting out all of the byproducts or you know unreacted things or whatever? You'd have to use chromatography for those. Uh, and so there's a lot of... Um, a lot of work has gone into chromatography. We have a lot of um, advanced methods for separating things. Um, but very simply though, 
uh, something you can do at home is if you take a piece of usually you use chromatography paper but this might work with just like a regular like thick paper if you were to just put a black dot kind of near the bottom and put some water uh, underneath it so the water can kind of move up the paper you would actually be able to see here let me put the water up here if you put some water in there you would be able to see eventually that you would end up with all these different colors coming out uh, based on just how much they like the water I'm just putting in random colors here. But this is uh, the idea of chromato chromatography. That's where it came from originally. I actually kind of inadvertently made a rainbow. It's pretty fun. Except I guess I forgot yellow. Oh well. Um, so the water would just move up and it would carry things along with it. And uh, how this works is it separates... by attraction. So uh, some of these uh, inks or pigments may be more attracted to water than the other pigments were, and so they would be more happy to travel along with the water. But some like this red one, which didn't really move very far, was not very attracted to the water, so it did not move very far at all. Uh, and so um, it just depends. There's a lot of uh, factors that go in here. Sometimes you use a special type of paper that would um, be attracted to certain compounds or you use different solvents. Uh, so water is what we'd be using in this case, but maybe you'd use acetone or formaldehyde or something like that or, or octane like gasoline, for example, you could use that as well. Um, and you would just separate these by their attraction to other molecules. Uh, we're going to spend... Um, Chapter seven, no, six. Yeah, chapter six is talking about uh, attractions between molecules. And so we'll be talking um, kind of other properties about this. But for now, it's just a way of separating things based on their uh, kind of attraction to each other. So um, that's kind of as, as far as I can go with it. For, uh, for right now, what I mean by attraction would be something like, uh, I mean, we all know water and oil don't mix, right? If we take some water, we put some olive oil in it, we're going to get layers because they don't mix. Uh, some things would prefer that oil. Some things would prefer the water. Um, and so you're going to see that something like uh, salt, for example, much more prefers the water than uh, it prefers the oil. And so it would dissolve in the water part, not the oil part. Uh, and so that's kind of this idea be behind the attraction. So certain molecules that have similar properties will be attracted to each other, uh, and you'll be able to use chromatography with those to separate them. Okay, so we kind of have four techniques there. We had just had like manual separation for really big stuff. We had filtration for when we have different phases of matter together. We had a solid, sand, and water. Uh, we would use filtration to separate those. We would use distillation if we had uh, liquids together uh, that had pretty different boiling points. <laughs> Relax, creature. Uh, and then we would use chromatography if all else fails. So chromatography is kind of our most specific technique, and it's also the most labor-intensive. So if you wanted to like isolate that green one, you would have to cut that out of the paper, and then you would have to do other stuff. Maybe you would uh, dissolve it in something and then distill it later, uh, and, and you'd have to do it that way. So um, there's a lot of work for chromatography. But for any of you who are maybe thinking about chemical industry, um, chromatography is, is a you know very 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 big important part of, of chemistry all right cool so any questions on any of those you know what let's see if yes and that's indeed how how it's spelled uh here i can go get him 
on Creature. <clears throat> creature hates everything. He is very mad all the time. Uh, yeah, this is Creature. So, um... Creature, did you just hit my tablet? I know, you're so mad. But yeah, so he's Creature because he's just so evil. Anyways... Uh, where were we? Okay, we finished chromatography, so, um, so yeah. This is potions class, actually, so, uh, that's really what we'll be doing in chemistry. So, um, here we go. We're going to talk about energy now. If anybody has any other questions about matter, of course, throw them out there, but other than that, we're going to continue on with energy. So yeah, this creature is just a ball of anger. Uh, he hates everything, so... But that's okay. So, energy comes in two main flavors. We have kinetic energy. And we have potential energy. Um... And we're going to see potential energy has a bunch of different kind of subtypes, but kinetic energy is going to be only one. So kinetic energy is energy of motion. So um, anytime things are moving, they will have some measure of kinetic energy. Uh, so uh, if, uh, you know, let me think of a not horrible example. All I can think of are horrible examples. No, no, I have a good one. Okay. Uh, if we uh, take an egg and throw it into the wall, because we're wasteful like that, uh, when we kind of um, mess with the kinetic energy of it, so it's got energy as it's flying across the air, right? It's got energy of motion. It's moving at a particular speed. Uh, technically, technically speaking... Kinetic energy is related to mass and velocity. We don't need to worry about this. I'm not going to... Oh, come on, Creech. Um, oh, his bed was taken when I took him up here. He's going to be mad. Um, it's related to mass and velocity. So if I throw that uh, egg at the wall, uh, it's going to... Uh, when I stop its kinetic energy, we can't just get rid of it, right? Uh, and so once it hits the wall, once the collision happens, some of the energy goes into the wall, but some of the energy still stays within the egg, forcing it to kind of like explode, right? Because just having that extra energy is a, uh, not a good thing. So um, I don't know where I was going with that example, but regardless, it's energy of motion. So um, the energy uh, was technically used to blow up that egg, I guess that's what I'm going for. Um, but potential energy has a bunch of different types. We have chemical potential energy. We have mechanical. We have electrical. We have gravitational. All different types of potential energy. I'm not going to write potential energy every single time. Um, but these are energy that could be used to do work. So uh, while kinetic energy is energy of motion, um, things that are moving, uh, potential energy is energy that could be used to make things move. Uh, whether that is chemical or mechanical or electrical, gravitational, whatever. Uh, gravitational is kind of the easiest one to use. Uh, if we have our rock on the top of a hill versus just on this flat surface, uh, this one has a pretty high gravitational potential energy compared to this one. Uh, because uh, as soon as we just, like, if we let that rock go, it's immediately going to start rolling down that hill, 
right? And it's going to go pretty fast. It's going to have, uh, its energy will be converted into kinetic energy. So, however, once it's just sitting there at the top of the hill, it has potential energy, but as soon as it starts rolling, that energy is converted into kinetic energy. Uh, with chemical potential energy, that's uh, energy that's stored in bonds, chemical bonds. And we can take advantage of that, like in a car engine, by burning it, for example, releasing that energy, and using that energy to move pistons kinetically to make our car move forward as well. Uh, and with mechanical energy, that's just like with the pistons, they move up and down, which uh, that energy can be uh, translated into uh, other ones. Uh, so there's all sorts of different potential energies. Uh, electrical potential energy would be uh, something like, uh, for example, our cells. Uh, we have voltage across our cells. Uh, our cells are slightly negatively charged inside uh, and slightly positively charged outside. Uh, and so there is uh, a difference there, and that energy can be used to do work as well. Uh, and we use that energy to, uh, you know, in neural conduction and all that sort of fun biology stuff. So, uh, you know, you have voltage-gated ion channels and blah, blah, blah that you learn about in biology class. Uh, those are all kind of using the idea of electrical potential energy. Uh, the electricity that can be stored in batteries is also potential energy. Uh, we can use it to uh, transfer into motion if we wanted, like if you had a... Uh, a remote control car or something, you'd have a battery in that car and you could use uh, that battery to make it uh, move uh, kinetically. So just some types of energy here. Alrighty, um, I typically don't ask stuff about the types of energy, I'm just telling you about them, so don't worry. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Aha! We're going to see uh, that we have various chemical processes uh, that we have to talk about energy uh, with. Uh, one of them that, for example, if we want, you know what, let's even, let's do this. Let's, let's do this one instead. If we want our water to go into steam, what do we have to do to it? How do we uh, how do we get water to turn into steam? Heat it up, right, right, right. So let's just put that in there. We can see that we have to put in energy. To make this happen, right? Uh, heat is a form of energy, right? So we're going to be having to put in energy to make this happen. We have a word for this. We call it endothermic. Endothermic procedures or processes uh, need energy to happen. So you have to give them energy to make them do their thing. Uh, that is what endothermic means. So if you have to put in energy, your process is endothermic. Uh, so for example, uh, or rather another way to describe that is energy is a reactant. If you want to think of this as a uh, chemical equation. <laughs> Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't know necessarily about the energetics of that. Um, there's a different driving force that makes baking soda and vinegar react, uh, which is the evolution of carbon dioxide, which we, oh, creature just tried to bite me. Isn't that nice? Uh, he's down there under my feet and I moved my foot too close to him. Um, that one um, we'll talk about more in chapter nine, but that um, it's not necessarily the energetics that are being the cause there. 
Uh, I would have to look it up specifically for that reaction to see if it's exo or endothermic. Uh, so I don't know quite off the top of my head. However, I do know that the opposite of process, uh, if we were to take uh, another reaction we've done this time, Yeah, I know, creature is just so angry. Um, if we were to burn a log or a piece of wood, uh, we would end up getting heat off, right? We know that fire gives off heat. Uh, we're going to know that that's a product Uh, and so that means this one would be exothermic. That one is giving off heat. And so uh, that's kind of the other term we would use for the opposite process. So with exo and endothermic, it's not necessarily related to temperature because obviously boiling water is hot, but so is a fire, right? Uh, it just kind of, you're looking at your process. So don't necessarily think in terms of heat. Uh, you just kind of want to think about where you're putting energy. Like if you have to put energy in to make it happen, or if you're getting energy out. Uh, for example, charging a battery would be an endothermic process, right? You're plugging in your phone. Uh, that's charging it up. You're putting in energy. You're giving your phone energy. Nothing to do with temperature, right? I mean, I guess your phone might get warm or something, but again, that has nothing to do with, with uh, this particular thing. When you're charging your phone, that's endothermic. When you're using your phone, that's exothermic. Uh, you know, you're, you're discharging the battery. So it's the opposite. Um, here, I'll just write that out. So that would be an example of an endothermic a process. So we're giving the phone energy. Um, or if I, you know, heat my coffee up in the microwave because I left it in the kitchen too long, that would be an endothermic process as well because I have to give my coffee some energy. So look at the energy. That's how you would tell if something is uh, exo or endothermic. Um, we're more going to talk about these in chapter seven again. So, uh, just kind of introducing the terms here when we're just briefly talking about energy. Um, but, uh, just kind of keep them in the back of your head for now. So, uh, we are pretty much done for today. Uh, next time, uh, on Monday, we will continue. Um, I believe we'll start chapter two. We'll have, st uh, we'll start with measurements and kind of, uh, math and chemistry and how to do fun sort of things like that. You're going to learn about sig figs, which you're going to hate, uh, and you will cry about it in the shower every morning uh, or late at night when you're trying to sleep. Uh, but that's kind of uh, my warning for you. So enjoy your last couple days of freedom before sig figs take over. So yeah, because Cassie remembers from last semester. So yeah, the uh, sig figs will, will come and haunt you. So with that, uh, enjoy your weekend. If any of you haven't done the participation thing from yesterday, go ahead and throw it in Discord. Um, I will have to just uh, send out emails to people who haven't done that, so please don't make me do extra work. <laughs> Nobody wants that. So, uh, so yeah. All right, I'll go ahead and put these up on Discord for you guys so you can have them. By the way, if I ever forget to do this, just uh, let me know. Um, I usually try and put the notes up on Discord uh, as soon as class is over, but sometimes it uh, skips my mind. Why won't you search? Oh, that's the comment. Duh. Lecture notes. Aha! All right, so that'll be up there in Discord for you guys, so you can uh, download that. Hooray, there it is. 
and I've uploaded it twice. No, that was yesterday. Never mind. Wow, I was at 10 o'clock sharp both days. How amazing. Yeah, awesome. I'm glad you are. Uh, enjoy your weekend, everyone. Stay safe, stay warm, uh, and we'll see you on Monday. No homework, so enjoy. <laughs>